Welcome to part four in my video series answering the question, what is gender? I hope it stands alone, but I suggest that you watch part three, if not all three videos that come before this. I'll try to explain any references to previous parts, but obviously the full context will make those explanations more understandable. Give us some of your political beliefs. Kill everyone now. Condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filter my politics. Filter Learning what we have about gender, it's natural to ask, what's next? One place we may turn to is called eliminativism. Some characterize performativity theory from part two as eliminativist. For example, Judith Butler, who wrote the influential performativity text Gender Trouble, says, There is no ontology of gender in which we might construct a politics. For gender ontologies always operate within established political contexts as normative injunctions, determining what qualifies as intelligible sex, invoking and consolidating the reproductive constraints on sexuality, setting the prescriptive requirements whereby sexed or gendered bodies come into cultural intelligibility. Ontology is thus not a foundation, but a normative injunction that operates insidiously by installing itself into political discourse as its necessary ground. Eliminating gender goes back to the early feminists, which we discussed in part one. Butler goes further and claims that setting any specific meaning of gender is dangerous and has consequences for who and what we can understand. Another gender eliminativist is Neil Gascoigne, who gives his view in response to Sally Haslinger's account of gender. As we discussed in the last video, Haslinger adopts an analytical approach to defining gender which means she defines gender in a way that allows us to effectively pursue our goals. We discussed how we can define gender in a way that points towards women's and trans people's liberation. Gascoigne disagrees with this approach. To continue to use the term woman is to implicate oneself in the very discourse of oppression that one seeks to overcome by continuing to keep in circulation a term around which cluster such deeply entrenched and morally and politically destructive associations. Accordingly, it is not the case that when humans cease to be subordinated on the grounds of their sexual characteristics, women will disappear. Rather, there never were any women. Gascoigne frames his account as a pragmatist one. He claims, much like Butler, that creating meanings of gender with a political purpose in mind has unpredictable consequences. We've already seen this in our investigation of gender. Early coat-rag views of gender excluded lesbians from being women and universalized sex and gender across cultures. Performativity theories ignored gender dysphoria, and more recent views that affirm trans people can often exclude non-binary or gender fluid people. We always run the risk of unintentional oppression or marginalization whenever we stick with a definition of gender. Gascoigne says, simple solution. Let's just stop trying and admit that there's nothing real about gender. And don't confuse this with Hasslinger's view that we should try to eliminate gender. Gascoigne says we should never have admitted there was any such thing at all. This difference actually highlights a distinction between what is called gender abolition and gender eliminativism. Eliminativists like Gascoigne claim that gender doesn't and has never existed, while abolitionists are closer to Hasslinger. Gender abolition pushes towards a world without gender. The difference between eliminativism and abolition is not major, as both are working towards the same ends and merely start from different positions. One could even be an abolitionist and an eliminativist at the same time. Are you impressed that I'm saying eliminativist perfectly every time? <laughs> okay, maybe not perfectly. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying, okay? I'm trying. It's, it's hard. Eliminativism and abolition are controversial. Some accuse abolitionists of advocating a totally drab world where everyone is exactly the same. This fear is unfounded, however, since gender abolition would really mean that currently gendered practices are freed from being gendered, and thus anyone can express themselves however they wish without fear. What will change in an abolitionist world is that no one will identify as a man, woman, or any other gender. Sometimes people suggest to me, with not a little horror, 
that I am arguing for a pastel world in which androgyny reigns and men and women are boringly the same. In my vision, however, strong colors coexist with pastels. There are and will continue to be highly masculine people out there. It's just that some of them are women, and some of the most feminine people I know happen to be men. While gender abolition might sound appealing to Oyeronke Oyewumi, who explained in part two how Yoruba culture had no gender categories, some members of other non-Western cultures might be getting worried. Gender abolition has been forced upon people before. British colonialism drove the Hydras in India and Two-Spirit people in the Americas out of public society. While this gender abolition was narrower and only eliminated non-binary genders, why would total gender abolition be any less colonial? Consider an argument by Matthew Call against abolition. A. The abolition of the category woman in a society entails that one cannot identify as a woman in that society. B. Trans women identify as women, and trans women in future societies will continue to identify as women. C. If one cannot identify as a woman in society, then trans women are wrong to identify as women in that society. And D. Thus a society in which the category woman is abolished misgenders trans people. So we can conclude that we ought not seek the abolition of the category woman. Perhaps we might deny the parenthetical in part B. That trans women in future societies will continue to identify as women. But what would that mean exactly? Why would trans women stop identifying as women? And also note that this argument also works for trans men, uh, some non-binary people, and even some cisgendered people. How and why would we want trans women to stop identifying as women? We don't want to enforce this violently like the British colonialists did, and it's a serious worry that we don't have a clear path on how to convince people to no longer identify with their gender. Gender can certainly be oppressive, but it can also be liberating. We can again see the analogies to race. Some, like Hasslinger, think that race is an inherently hierarchical and oppressive system, so we should abolish it. But one might believe, like G.K. Jeffers, that there is a cultural aspect to race that we don't want to abolish. Similarly, the answer to this question of gender abolition depends on what meaning we assign to gender. However, as I hopefully have gotten across at this point, gender is complicated. We don't have a complete understanding that includes all the ways gender shows up in our lives. Pluralism about gender is widely accepted, and there's a real worry that gender abolition implies we can eliminate gender in all its meanings, rather than only in the hierarchical ones. Even if this isn't convincing you to abandon gender abolition, it's reasonable to look for alternatives. Let's look for some. Xenofeminism is a theory and movement articulated by the German group Laboria Cubonics. Xenofeminism's manifesto describes multiple facets of the theory, one of which is gender abolition. But they understand abolition differently than we described it earlier. Xenofeminism is gender abolitionist. Gender abolitionism is not code for the eradication of what are currently considered gender traits from the human population. Under patriarchy, such a project could only spell disaster. The notion of what is gendered sticks disproportionately to the feminine. But even if this balance were redressed, we have no interest in seeing the sexuate diversity of the world reduced. Let a hundred sexes bloom. Gender abolitionism is shorthand for the ambition to construct a society where traits currently assembled under the rubric of gender no longer furnish a grid for the asymmetric operation of power. Instead of getting rid of gender, xenofeminism desires to let a hundred sexes bloom and expand gender categories. The gender abolition is specifically targeted at the unequal distribution of power. We've seen that this is only one way to understand gender, and xenofeminism appreciates that alternative meanings of gender exist. You know, people are entitled to their sexual proclivities, you know, I mean, let there be a thousand Blossoms bloom as far as I'm concerned, you know, but I ain't spending any time on it because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. 
I think that gender abolition is just poor phrasing, as often happens in political philosophy. There is more agreement between the abolitionists and the anti-abolitionists than the name suggests. There are serious worries that we all need to address regarding self-identification, colonialism, and misgendering, but perhaps some of this criticism can be avoided with a new term. Gender liberation? I, I don't know. When discussing abolishing gender, let's be specific and recognize the multiple usages and importance of the word gender and abolition. I hope my discussions in the last three videos can help with that. Discussions about gender often have an emphasis on language. Do you say transgender or transsexual? Biological woman or assigned female at birth? A mundane part of speech like pronouns is suddenly a huge political issue. Much of this is part of a culture war intended to distract us from serious issues like healthcare access. But language is a part of our lives and the language we use often reflects the cultural values we hold. In 1985, William Satire, an alias for the computer scientist Douglas R. Hofstadter, published an article written for an alternate universe. In the other universe, people don't speak English, they speak Ringlish. Ringlish is just like English, with a small difference. Instead of having gender-specific words, it has race-specific words. While we have words like chairman, congressman, manslaughter, in Ringlish they have chair white, congress white, and white slaughter. Ringlish has different pronouns. Instead of he for men and she for women, Ringlish has we for white people and blee for black people. Or maybe it's way and play. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. It gets worse. In English, we have Mr. for men and Miss for unmarried women and Mrs. for married women. Ringlish similarly has Master for white people, Nis for unemployed black people, and Nisses for employed black people. This is a horrifying language. True to his pseudonym, Hofstadter's point was to satirize people who complain about activists trying to degender English. In the alternate universe, William Satire is complaining about how anti-racist activists are trying to ruin the Ringlish language by removing race-based words. Ringlish is a very disturbing language, and if we had a race-specific language, you can imagine it would be much more difficult to fight racism since racism is built into the language. We can sympathize with the activist William Satire is arguing with who want to change the language to be less racist. We are in a similar situation, except the discrimination in English is gendered, not racial. Why do we have different honorifics for married and unmarried women, but not for men? Why is man so often used as a default for all humans? Would it be okay to defend the phrase, all whites are created equal, by saying, oh, what by whites they just meant all people, regardless of race? Yet we hear the same argument for the statement, all men are created equal. How does Ringlish account for people who are neither white nor black? How does English account for people who are neither man nor woman? Race and gender are different. Perhaps there is a good reason to have a gender-specific language and not a race-specific one. We don't need to change our language to be gender neutral, although I do think that would be good. The point is, however, that gender abolition doesn't need to be total. Perhaps there are areas of life where gender should be abolished like on our passports, or in our pronouns, or honorifics. We should have these discussions about the future of gender. Do we desegregate sports? Bathrooms? Is gender necessary on birth certificates, or when opening a bank account? I won't try to answer these questions now because I don't know, but it's probably true that we don't need gender in many situations. Speaking of bank accounts, do you remember back in part 1 when I said the Equal Credit Opportunity Act wasn't passed until 1974? That was an anti-discrimination law that stopped banks from discriminating against people based on gender, race, sex, religion, and all that. Famously, it meant that financial institutions could no longer require a woman to get her husband's permission to open an account. In her article, which was later expanded into a book titled why women had better sex under socialism, 
Kristen Godsey looks at some data that shows that women in the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc had more satisfying sex and sex more often than their Western European counterparts. Godsey argues that in addition to enforcing women's rights and protections, economic equality resulted in improvements in women's sex lives. Since they weren't financially dependent on a man, women in socialist societies enjoyed more freedoms than women in capitalist ones. Godsey is quick to point out that life was difficult in the USSR for many reasons, but at least in terms of women's rights and gender equality, it progressed much faster than in the West. We also have examples of the converse, where women's rights were reversed as a result of the introduction of capitalism. Once again, we turn to Oyoronke Oyoumi to describe the impact of the colonial imposition of private property. The idea that persons occupying land had a right of ownership must have turned many a family property into private property, usually male-owned. First, the movement from collective ownership of land to private and individual ownership was stacked against women because by colonial definition, as the wording of the ordinance suggests, only men could be individuals. Second, given that marriage residence in Yoruba land was in general patrilocal, it is not likely that a woman occupied land by himself. I should be quick to note that the apparent disadvantage in this case stemmed not from the Yoruba tradition of patrilocality, but from the colonial law that occupation of land constituted ownership, thereby abrogating the pre-colonial rights of access conferred by birth. As we have discussed, the creation of gender was a part of the process of colonization. The European colonists used wage labor as a way of subjugating the population, and by excluding women from receiving wages, Europa's women's labor had no exchange value. In a capitalist economy, this exchange value is paramount, and thus women needed to rely on men in order to participate in the economy. Despite the great strides women have made in Western capitalist societies, we still have nothing near gender equality. Men overwhelmingly dominate the most powerful positions in our societies, in business, politics, and everywhere else. Can we imagine a better world? A world where men and women would be equal is easy to imagine because it is exactly the one the Soviet Revolution promised. Women raised and educated exactly like men would work under the same conditions and for the same salaries. Erotic freedom would be accepted by custom, but the sexual act would no longer be considered a remunerable service. Women would be obliged to provide another livelihood for themselves. Marriage would be based on a free engagement that the spouses could break when they wanted to. Motherhood would be freely chosen. That is, birth control and abortion would be allowed. And in return, all mothers and their children would be given the same rights. Maternity leave would be paid for by the society that would have responsibility for the children, which does not mean that they would be taken from their parents, but that they would not be abandoned to them. Not only are our institutions run mostly by men, but by an increasingly tiny group of men. The more wealth is concentrated in a few hands, the more impact their biases and prejudices have. As money and power funnel upwards, it's not just going from poor to rich, but from women to men. The vast majority of the world's poor are women, and the vast majority of the rich are men. Some apologists for the status quo try to explain away these disparities as individual choices. But we now understand gender, whatever it is, is socially constructed. And here we have another social construct, an economic system called capitalism that advantages a group of men at the expense of a group made mostly of women. Women perform the majority of unpaid labor, such as household chores and child rearing. The economy cannot function without the important work that women do. And as before, we have not mentioned non-binary people, people who are neither men nor women. Non-binary people have made progress, but their exploitation is even worse than women. What does this mean for the future? It can feel frustrating to wrap one's mind around. Gender, colonialism, and capitalism have so fundamentally shaped our world, it's difficult to imagine how things can even get better. To me, though, the answer is well stated by Alison Escalante. The abolition of gender will only be achieved as a result of the abolition of the material conditions which reinforce it with their ideologies of sexual difference. This means destroying the capitalist system which produces the nuclear family as a fundamental social structure. 
This means overcoming colonialism and white supremacy, which rely on gendered discourses to justify their violence and establish ideologies of hypersexuality and deviance. This means recognizing that these things can only be overcome by a communist politics oriented toward the future. Abandon nihilism, abandon hopelessness, demand and build a better world. I don't want to further drag out this discussion. I will eventually make a video about the intersections of gender and class, but until I do, you can watch my other videos. Gender is complicated. For some, that point was made in the first 10 minutes of part one. Hopefully, by going through this incomplete history of gender, I have revealed that philosophies of gender will not be resolved via social media debates, angry church sermons, or even a four-part YouTube series. I don't want the complexity to discourage people from talking and learning about gender. On the contrary, I hope that this isn't the end of your gender research, but the beginning. I have posted a complete list of books and articles I've read in the description of each video, and I hope something sounded interesting to you and you decide to read it, and then read the citations, and then keep learning, and then you talk about it. We don't know what we don't know. People often seem uninterested in engaging with the literature on gender and have decided they know the answers. The comments on my last video reveal that about many people. To give you a place to start, I'll review some of the theories we've looked at in all four parts of this series and the people I've quoted. In video one, we started at the beginning. First, gender never referred to biology in medical or feminist literature, but was originally about socialization and social interactions. Since its first application in humans, sex and gender have been differentiated. We learned the origins of this usage of gender was from John Money's unethical experiments on intersex people. Then, early feminists like Gail Rubin and Katherine McKinnon adopted the term gender for purposes of describing women's oppression. Later on, Sally Haslinger also used gender this way, connecting gendered oppression to racial oppression. We saw how Monique Wittig made a connection between heterosexuality, women's oppression, and gender allying feminism and gay liberation against heteronormativity. The views of these feminists were labeled by Linda Nicholson as coat rack views because their slogan, gender is the social meaning of sex, theorized sexed bodies as prior to one's gendered socialization. This view was challenged in video two, where we first recognized alternative conceptions of gender outside of white societies. Oyeronke Oyewumi described the absence of gender in Yoruba culture. Ifi Amidiyume described non-binary genders in African cultures. Angela Davis described the degendering of enslaved black people. These and other examples pointed us to stand against universalizing gender concepts like patriarchy or womanhood. Because of this and Paul Griffith's description of evolutionary biology's account of sex, Linda Nicholson led us to challenge the understanding of sex as biological, and Judith Butler's conception that sex was always already gender. Butler, along with Candace West and Don Zimmerman, adopted a performativity account of gender, which saw gender as a process or performance that we enact. This creates the illusion of a sex that existed prior to our gender masquerade. Mary Holmes outlined some differences in performativity. Then video three took on a different perspective. Talia Mae Betcher asked us to include trans people in our gender conversation. We looked at Jennifer McKittrick's dispositional account, which aimed to include gender dysphoria in performativity accounts. While looking at transgender, we heard from Robin Dembroff and Talia Betcher on how to adopt a politically strategic concept of gender, pulling again on Sally Haslinger's pragmatism. Dembroff helped us understand that the dominant meaning of gender doesn't need to be our understanding of gender, and also highlighted the importance of non-binary genders in challenging the dominant understanding of gender. Finally, in this video, we thought about the future of gender. Neil Gascoigne asked us to recognize gender as unreal, while Hasslinger asked us to work towards eliminating gender. Matthew Call challenged this gender abolition as possibly transphobic and colonial, Laboria Kubanix introduced us to xenofeminism, which sought to abolish gender by expanding. We debated whether abolition could be partial, and then we finally discussed how capitalism creates and perpetuates gender hierarchies. 
and Alison Escalante hinted at a vision for the future. I'll end with this. Gender has been oppressive in the past. We don't know if it always will be. Should we eliminate it? Or can we one day find the ultimate inclusive meaning of gender? It's not easy to say what the future holds. But I am confident in the present. We must challenge gender norms, gender roles, and gender stereotypes, as well as those oppressive norms related to sex and sexuality. Gender might be an expression of who you are or something that creates who you are, but either way, we should celebrate, support, and experiment with genders that are unique, subversive, and outside the boundaries. Rather than be afraid of those who undermine and challenge our conceptions of gender, we should stand in solidarity. Women's oppression, trans people's oppression, and non-binary people's oppression is all of our oppression. And thus, women's, trans, and queer liberation is all of our liberation. If identities were no longer fixed as the premises of a political syllogism, and politics no longer understood as a set of practices derived from the alleged interests that belonged to a set of ready-made subjects, a new configuration of politics would surely emerge from the ruins of the old. Cultural configurations of sex and gender might then proliferate, or rather, their present proliferation might then become articulable within the discourses that establish intelligible cultural life, confounding the very binaryism of sex and exposing its fundamental unnaturalness. Thanks for watching. Be gay, do crimes. PK do crime. PK do crime. PK do crime. PK do crime. PK do crimes.